Hello and welcome to First Look, a Bible study looking ahead to the reading or readings for the coming Sunday. My name is Carl and it's really good to have you with us. This week we're continuing our journey through the Sermon on the Mount and exploring Jesus' teaching around being salt and light in the world and about his relationship to the law and the prophets. Before we dive into any of that, however, if you've not done so already, you may find it useful to download the sheet accompanying this study. You can find the link for that in the YouTube video description, but you might need to click on show more to reveal it. On the sheet, you will find the text of today's reading, some other passages you may wish to look up, the questions we'll be considering together later on, and lots of room for you to record your own thoughts and observations. And so then, without further ado, let's dive into today's passage, which comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 13 to 20. We've just heard, towards the end of chapter 4, about Jesus calling his first disciples and then beginning travelling around the region of Galilee, preaching the good news that the kingdom of God had come near and curing the sick. That's chapter 4 verses 18 to 23. And we learn in the subsequent two verses, verses 24 and 25, that this meant that Jesus' fame spread rapidly and he attracted people to him, not just from Galilee, but also from Syria and the Decapolis, the Ten Towns, from Jerusalem and Judea, and from the region alongside the River Jordan. In other words, those same people who'd gone out to be baptised by John the Baptist. And it's that which is the prelude to what we now call the Sermon on the Mount, which covers chapters 5 through to 7 in Matthew's Gospel. Mountains were places that were traditionally associated with encounter with God, and we see that time and again in the Exodus story, for instance. So it's probably not surprising that when Jesus sits down and begins to teach as a rabbi, he does so from the setting of a mountain. And what Matthew does in the Sermon on the Mount is collect together a large group of sayings of Jesus. And it's one of five blocks of that that we find within this gospel. Some argue mirroring the five books of the Torah. Today's extract of the Sermon on the Mount follows on from verses 1 to 12 of chapter 5 and the Beatitudes that we thought about in last week's study, which point to God's favour towards humanity and to unexpected categories of people being regarded in the kingdom as blessed. So that sets the scene for what Jesus is now going to go on to say. So in this passage, we have Jesus at the beginning of his public ministry and having attracted large crowds to come and hear what he's got to say. We also have said crowds, a mixture of Jews and Gentiles uh, from the description we have. So drawn from quite a wide area. And by reference, we have Pharisees and scribes. Now the Judaism of Jesus' day was diverse and it was lively and the Pharisees were one of the main parties within it. They shared a commitment to righteousness and holiness with Jesus and indeed the Jewish historian Josephus tells us that they were regarded by many as being the bearers of the gold standard for righteousness and that will be important later on. The scribes, who are often associated with the Pharisees, were experts in the Jewish law. Now, Matthew's Gospel was the second of the canonical Gospels to be written, likely around 75 to 80 of the Common Era. So at a time post the destruction of the Jerusalem Temple in the year 70 and the resulting divergence between church and synagogue. And also, Matthew was writing to a predominantly Jewish audience and his gospel of the four canonical gospels is the one that's generally most regarded as heavily invested in second temple judaism there are other texts it's useful for us to 
keep in mind as we grapple with this collection of sayings of Jesus. And I'll say more as I go through, but we may wish to turn to Mark chapter 9 verse 50 or Luke chapter 14 verse 34 to find other examples of Jesus's pithy saying about being the salt of the earth. That reference to his saying about salt leads us into the first part of today's reading, which divides up into two pericopes. Chap verses 13 to 16 cover Jesus' teaching about being salt and light. And then verses 17 to 20 tell us about how he understood his relationship to the law and the prophets. So we begin in verses 13 to 16. Jesus' followers are described in the present tense in these verses as being salt and light. And that's because I think Jesus is wanting to make the point that how our lives in the kingdom look and taste matters. Being tasty, being lit up can make a big difference in the world. Now in verse 13, the reference to salt as the salt of the earth probably reflects salt's origin as something that comes from the earth. And we can recognise it's got many applications. It's good for seasoning and flavour. My mind is of Job chapter 6, verse 6. It's something that can purify. And that might remind us of 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 19 to 23. And it also acts as a preservative. Now, the value of salt consists not in the thing itself so much as these various ways we can apply it. And we as disciples in these callings to be salt of the earth and light of the world are also called, it seems, to exist for others. But salt, as Jesus warns us, may literally become foolish in the Greek moraine uh, by losing its saltiness. And if it's lost its saltiness, we can't get it back. So there's really nothing to do but to discard it. And Jesus talks about throwing it on the ground and trampling it underfoot. In verses 14 to 16, having been given this injunction to be the salt of the earth, we're also called to uh, think about shining out our light in the darkness, which might remind us of the calling to do that and people being lost in the dark. In Isaiah 59 verse 10. But this isn't simply about enabling others to see in the dark. It's also about enabling them to witness acts of justice undertaken by God's followers and for the source of which is in God. So the images of a city on a hill that can't be concealed in verse 14 and the light in the home not being hidden by a bushel basket in verse 15. And note how ridiculous it is to put a light in your home and then cover it up with a basket. Both of these point to God being given glory by our shining out God's light for our various deeds of righteousness. That's where we get to in verse 16. It's easy in a world where something like salt is plenteous. It's, you know, something just sat on the table, a cheap... Uh, condiment and where light is everywhere we can't escape electric lighting indeed light pollution is something of an issue in our society it's easy to forget a that salt was very valuable in jesus's time and also that people were used to a world that was a lot darker physically than ours you know, there wasn't so much light around and so these things were precious and significant in a way that we could easily miss today if we um, forget those bits of context. So Jesus is calling us to be really quite significant and important things in that first pericope in verses 13 to 16. Our attention now turns then to the second pericope in today's reading, verses 17 to 20. And Jesus is teaching about his relationship to the law and the prophets. Now in verse 17, the Greek word that's used for abolish, katalu, um, is something that means to, to tear something apart or to loosen it. And it's the opposite of building things up. 
we might be reminded of Jesus is talking about the Jerusalem temple being torn down in, for example, chapter 24, verse 2, chapter 26, verse 61 and chapter 27, verse 40. So Jesus does talk about so he wanted to destroy the temple. It will be rebuilt in three days. But Jesus is specific about not seeking to abolish the law and the prophets, not to tear them down. He intends instead to fulfil them in the Greek pleru. Um, and that doesn't mean to complete or to bring to an end as such, as we may interpret those, those things, so much as to apply the law of Moses and the teaching of the prophets anew in Jesus' particular context. And we need, as we read this, to remember that Jesus was a faithful Jew involved in some at times quite heated but lively conversations with others about the character of the people of Israel, what went to the heart of who they are, and in particular how to make sense of the teaching of the law and the prophets. And if we read on in the Sermon on the Mount, we find various instances of Jesus saying, you have heard it said, dot, 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 but I tell you, the most famous example perhaps being loving our enemies. It shows that Jesus thought there was some scope for reinterpretation and it highlights this focus on applying the law and the prophets. Jesus goes on in verse 18 to talk about not one jot or tittle to use the wonderful King James Version translation of this verse um, being erased from the law of the prophets until heaven and earth pass away. The NRSV has the slightly less prosaic not one stroke of a letter will, will pass away. In our context, we might think of that as being like dotting the I's and crossing the T's. It's, it's those things that distinguish letters in Hebrew from, from one another. And when Jesus says that not one of these little details will uh, be erased from the law of the prophets until heaven and earth pass away, it's pointing us to, I think, the consistency of God's character as liberator, as the God who led the people out of oppression in Egypt and will continue to liberate and bring freedom, and to God's character as the source of goodness who can be trusted. If we were, as Jesus makes the point in verse 19, to discard the law and the prophets or hack away at them or loosen them up in some way, tear them apart, then effectively we're saying that God's promises and the consistency of God's character do not matter somehow. And we also render asunder the relationship between commandment and narrative that runs through the whole of the Hebrew scriptures and perhaps is exemplified most in, in Deuteronomy, where Moses reminds the people that they were once slaves in Egypt and gives them commandments on that basis, connecting their story of exodus and liberation and freedom with what they are then to do with the source of the law and indeed Later on, the prophets um, really kind of get the people to think about um, the essence of those things in really challenging circumstances. This little pericope concludes with a challenge that has too often been dismissed in the life of the church, I think, in verse 20, with the challenge to be greater in righteousness than the Pharisees and the scribes, who we talked about as one of the great groups within Judaism. It reflects the commitment of the Pharisees and the scribes to the law and to righteousness, to that kind of um, virtuous living that St. Josephus says they were noted for. And so to exceed their righteousness is no mean feat. It's, it's a really important thing. And to go back to this idea of, uh, you know, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, love your neighbours as yourselves. And, Pray for those who persecute you. I think that's a really powerful example of Jesus leading us into that greater righteousness with his different interpretations. So this is a kind of mixed bag of a text, really. The first half, perhaps quite well known and um, might seem quite a bit easier, perhaps, to deal with than what we find in the second part in verses 17 to 20. But taking it as a unit, there's a real fleshing out here, I think, of the kind of life of the kingdom of God, which Jesus has been 
talking about having drawn near in his person. And with that in mind, we now turn to think more deeply about some of the questions this text generates by looking at our particular questions for this week. <laughs> 